everybody saw the red, and they knew immediately what it was. And their guns were firing within 30 seconds on the ships and on the beach. I joined the Navy in, uh, after high school, uh, graduated from high school, Weaver's High School, in, outside of Denver, Colorado, and uh, went there? in the Navy there. How old were you at that time? 18. 18. We okay. could sign up. We could sign up for four years without any parent signature or anything at 18. 17, you had to get your parent signature. And what year was that? 39, 1939. You told us when you just joined. Um, were you initially stationed at Pearl Harbor, or was that no? Uh, when I got up three months of boot camp, San Diego, we were uh, four or five of us from that uh, division was sent to Long Beach. All of the ships were uh, anchored in Long Beach then, the Navy in San Diego and Seattle and San Francisco, and we went to board the uh, Arizona first of January of forty. Uh, 1940, and uh, April 1st, the whole fleet went for the mo maneuvers outside of Hon south of Honolulu, south of the Hawaiian Islands. Then that was April 1st of 40. We first hit uh, Oahu and Maui and Lahaina Roads. And we finished the maneuvers, and Washington decided that it was going to keep the fleet in Pearl. And so that's when we went into Pearl Harbor and stayed and uh, moved out of Seattle and San Francisco, Long Beach to San Diego. And so the whole fleet was there. So then after that, we operated half the fleet, out, half the battleships. At that time, we had battleships, we had four carriers. We had eight battleships out there. We'd have whole division, three battleships, like our division, battleship division number one, we had the Oklahoma, Nevada, and Arizona. And then others had the West Virginia, California, and Maryland and, uh, in them. And uh, each one had Rear Admiral as Commander Battleship Division. And when I first went aboard the Arizona, Captain Isaac C. Kidd was our skipper. And uh, then he left, and Captain Train came aboard. And then he left, and Captain Van Valkenburg came aboard, and then Admiral Kidd came back as a rear admiral, commander of battleship division number one. And he's still on the ship. He was buried. Uh, he was killed December 7th, along with Captain Van Valkenburg. So uh, uh, no. we stayed out. We never came back. Well, we came back then in, uh, we crossed the equator in July of 40, and then we went back to Pearl. And then uh, in, uh, September, we came back to Bremen and Washington for three months overall. I went home in November of 40 for my young sister's wedding, November 30th, and then we went, we got out of Bremen and went back to Pearl Harbor, and we never came back. And so, uh, okay. What, what were your duties on the, on the Arizona initially? When I first went aboard, Chief picked us up at the uh, quarterdeck and we came in and saluted and reported for duty with our sea bags and hammocks. At that time, we had hammocks. We slept with hammocks in boot camp and on the Arizona, we had hooks. We put the hammocks down every day in the hammock thing. And uh, we walked up to Division 2 and he says, there's your hooks, there's your uh, baggage uh, for hammock uh, bag, uh, and uh, so I'll see you on deck in 15 minutes. So we, well, I was in second division, and my battle station was the uh, lower handling room in turret number two. Because at that time, the three 14 inch guns, they had round bags, 105 pounds a piece, and they put four of them in each barrel to shoot a shell off. They put the shell in first, 15, 1600 pounds, and they shoved four bags in and closed the hatch, you know, and the breach. And, uh, uh, so we had over a million pounds of powder in the forward uh, uh, lower handling rooms. So uh, uh, I was, you know, we were getting $21 a month, so not too much money. So I'd lean up on the hammock and I studying most of the time for seaman first class. He took an exam for seaman first. I became seaman second in about four months and I got $36 a month. So. I was seaman second class then, and 
lay down the hammock. And so uh, after uh, a while, Bob Sink, who was the chief quartermaster, came down to her and said, Lou, I see you're up there studying. You're not going ashore much. You don't have that much money to go ashore. And uh, how would you like to be a quartermaster striker? And I said, I'd love to be because we all knew that the quartermasters were with the officer's deck captain all the time. They kept the logs and they were on the bridge and they were on the quarter deck. They didn't have to scrub decks. And uh, so it's like an advancement. And so it wasn't a week later that I was transferred from 2nd Division into N Division, which is Navigation Division. And I had to learn charts and grids, you know, and maps and charts and grids and uh, uh, latitude, longitudes, and everything else because I had to navigate in star sites. And that's what I did. And uh, for, uh, and I passed my first exam, third class quartermaster. and. Uh, four months before the Pearl Harbor hit. And at that time, if you got third class before three years, four years, you were journeying the next 30-month trip to China for AJAC duty. And uh, so I was, oh my God, I'll probably head up to China. Well, I was on the Arizona football team and B.J. Johnson, and he's gunner's mate third in Division Five, And in... Uh, September, because half the fleet would go up and half would come in. Four battleships go up, four stay in, or three would go out with the cruisers and destroyers and one carrier, and the rest of them would stay in. And then on a Monday, when we'd come back, we'd stay out, the other half went to sea, and then we'd come in, because we knew we were preparing for war. And so uh, uh, there was never over uh, half the ships in to port. And uh, so in September, when Johnny said, let's go to flight school, and I said, we can't, Johnny. I said, we're right arm rage, because the gunner's mate and the quartermaster right arm, and aviation machinists and aviation radioman and, and mech were left arm rates. And they had, they were the, with the planes, and at that time, from 1934 to 44, the Navy took 30 enlisted men out of the fleet that's how the whole fleet, Atlantic and Pacific fleet, to go to Pensacola and get your wings. And if you pass it, flight school and got your wings, you went into a flying status then and whatever they, you, cause you had to learn all the carriers and everything in those days, catapults. So uh, anyway, I had met a girl over in Honolulu, he Helen Hester Hitchcock. She was a senior at Punahou High School. And Heck, I was only 20, she was 17, so she took me in. I met her mother and dad, and finally, after a couple of three months, they just gave me one of the bedrooms, and I'd take my sailor uniform on and put a pair of Hawaiian shirt and Hawaiian shorts on, and we'd go to the movie or something, but I have to say that they kept me in good. I didn't run around with all the sailors down to the whorehouses and everything. And uh, I was with Hester, and they fed me, and I'd go back to the base, and it was really good. So uh, anyway, uh, I was over at their house for first of September, and went in for, had for dinner, and Admiral Calhoun came in, who was commander of base force, and he's the one that wrote the orders for Pensacola and everything. And so we're sitting there, and he said, well, Lou, what do you do? And everything, going to college or anything? I said, no, Admiral, I got to tell you, I'm a third-class quartermaster on the USS Arizona. He said, well, that's fine. So I told him about Johnny saying, let's go to flight school. And he said, well, there's nothing the law against it. He said, it's just that most of them are with the planes all the time, and nobody else puts in for it. So I said, when you go back to the Arizona, take your exam, and it's have your request uh, signed by your executive officer or captain, send it over to me, and I'll see if it passes all right. So I went back to the ship, and I said, geez, let's take the test. So we got a hold of Lieutenant Ragsdale, who was a, our pilot aboard the Arizona, one of our pilots, a senior pilot. And the next time we went to sea, he gave Johnny and a ride off number three catapult. We were at sea, and doing 15, 18 knots into the wind and shot out and the first time I'd ever been in an airplane in my life. And so 
We shot off, went at 5,000 feet, and they spun around and came back. And at that time, the ship would make a hard port turn, and they'd make a big slick there, and they'd throw out a boom, and the plane would come in and land on that slick, and we were in the open sea. And we'd taxi up on a rope mat, and then the pilot would reach over and hold our belt while we stood up, and we'd grab the hook and hook it into the plane. They'd set us back on the catapult. And so we passed that, and we sent the... Uh, Request over to Admiral Calhoun in November, the f first week of November, we got orders to Pensacola, China. And uh, I know it was all because knowing Harvey, Harvey uh, Hester's father, Harvey Hitchcock, was a graduate engineer of Colgate, and he was vice president of Honolulu Dredging and Hawaiian Construction Company, and he worked for the Navy Department under Admiral Calhoun in Pearl Harbor. And so uh, uh, it was logical. Anyway, uh, we made our reservations to go back the 20th of November to San Francisco, on the Lurling and going back to Pensacola. Well, Captain Van Valkenburg called us down, kicked off and said, Johnson, you and Connor uh, are not going back in the Lurling. And he said, I'm not going to waste $5,000 in Navy money. He said, we're going back December the 19th to Long Beach to pick up our 1.1 guns, so you go back with us and go from there. And those days you said, yes, sir, Captain, and that was it. So we went to sea the last uh, week in November and came back the 5th of December. And on the way in, why, uh, we were coming into port on a Friday. We were already in on Friday, the 5th. And Admiral Kidd said to Captain Van Bachner, we should not be going back into port, period. And, uh, but we had to go in. So, of course, the seventh, the Japanese hit five minutes to eight in the morning. And, uh, and nine minutes after eight, eight or nine minutes after, I was keeping the log pretty well, but uh, Kurt Haynes, my other quartermaster, went to the bridge with Captain Vockenberg and took the log book with him and everything. And, and uh, Captain and Admiral Kidd came through right as well. They were heading for their bridges. And Captain Van Valkenburg says, Connor, secure the quarter and come to the bridge. He secured the lines because the vessel was outboard of us. So the quartermaster was on, went forward to cut the lines forward on the port side. And I pulled the gangplank in. And uh, eight minutes after eight or something, then nine minutes after it started, a plane came across to probably 10,000, 12,000 feet with a 16, 1700 pound uh, bomb on it, dropped and got a lucky hit. They hit the bomb hit uh, on the starboard side forward by number two turret, on the starboard side of number two turret. Went through five decks and into the lower handling room. And when it went in the lower handling room, there went a million pounds of powder. It blew up, and that's in the pictures you all see of it. And the bow came about 30, 40 feet out of the water and it fell straight back down. And uh, Bob came out of the, the uh, uh, from the bow from the fire after throwing the lines off to the vessel and cut the lines. And Commander Fuqua, who was our senior officer aboard then, he was our first lieutenant, came up on the quarter deck, and he was over by number four. And we got a bomb over there, and he got knocked out for a while. And we were over between number three turret and the bulkhead, and it didn't hit us. About four of us over there. And so he came to and took charge of the whole ship. And uh, he ordered us to get the guys running out of the fire, and it was pretty bad. And he said, knock them unconscious if you have to, because they'll, if they jump over the side, they'll get burned to death in the fire. So we laid uh, 15 or 60 of them down on the deck there. They were coming out burned. And uh, then about 40 minutes, about 9.30, 8.30 or 9.20, we don't know exactly what time, but around that time, Commander Fuqua said, abandon ship, because uh, we just couldn't, uh, uh, it was burning so bad forward and everything else, and the boats were tied up by the dock, and we were tied up by the Fox 8 Key, and the Liberty boats were tied up, there was 50-foot motor launches by the uh, uh, Keys. So we loaded the guys in the launches and uh, to take him to the hospital ship and we abandoned ship and 
for the next uh, two days, we fought the fire with the ships, with the boats hauling the hoses in. And on Tuesday, the fire came down a little bit, so uh, we got over the base force and slept for one night. And then we went back, and when the ship cooled down, Pete Huzar was our chief water tenor, and he was our chief diver. And about uh, 12, 13 of us went aboard the ship and dove with shallow water helmets. And he dove with a helmet. He could stay down three or four hours. We'd stay down 30, 45 minutes with a shallow water helmet. The guy's pumping air to us from on the deck. And uh, after uh, four or five days of that, why, Pete told Commander Fruko that it was just too dangerous. We were getting our air hoses caught on the uh, jagged edges of the hatches and everything. So they called it off. And uh, I went to base force, and uh, Johnny was transferred out to a destroyer, and he was third class gunner's mate, and destroyed on a destroyer with gunner's mate, went out to sea, because they thought the Japanese were going to land, and the ships were available, there was only a few of them, and they were out to sea watching the coast. And so uh, that must have been around the... 15th, 18th or something, the 20th of December, because I got a call into Harvey that I was okay, and he got a call to my mother just before Christmas of 41, because she'd gotten a telegram, I was missing an action, that I was okay, but just because I couldn't call her anything, but he called. And uh, so they called us, so anyway, it's December the 23rd, I remember, going to the hospital and saw a light foot, and he was in pretty bad shape. He was one of our boys. And he died two days later. And uh, then uh, Pete and I were transferred up to Honolulu because uh, Captain Geiselman was our executive officer. He was a full commander, but he made him captain immediately. And uh, uh, they made him provost marshal. And he wanted us up there because we were experienced as 45s and experienced in show patrol and everything else. And uh, we put out the order that nobody was to be on the streets after sunset or before sunrise. They'd get shot. And they knew we meant it. And uh, there was nobody that upset that or tried to upset it or demonstrate or anything else. They just lived with it till May of 1945 when it was pulled. So... Uh, we were in the camp guys went up there and then so at our first liberty was about the fifth or sixth something, first week or something of January of forty two. And of course naturally I went over to Hester's to see her and her mother and father and they did that night because the first liberty I'd had in thirty to forty days. And uh, in walked Admiral Calhoun. And he said, I thought I signed your orders for Pensacola and I told him what happened. We lost him on the seventh in the Arizona, and Johnny was out to sea and destroyer. And it wasn't three days he had Johnny ordered back in the port and me off. The, uh, and we were on a reservation for the next Lurling back to uh, San Francisco. And on our way back, we had thousands of uh, women and children from the military going back to the United States. Because remember, ter that was territory of Hawaii then. It was not a state. And uh, military wives and children were out there, and they wanted to get them out of that war zone, so they were bringing them back to the state. So we, five days, had duty on the Lurling, taking care of watching and taking care of those students. We hit San Francisco. He got a train, because we didn't have planes in those days. We took trains. He took a train through Texas to go to Pensacola, and I took one through Denver to go to Pensacola. And... Uh, we got stopped one day in our hometown to see our family. Went on to Pensacola, and we started the third week or fourth week in January, and that enlisted class. And we went seven days a week, seven nights a week, studied. I helped with all the navigation to the pilots. They, other a, uh, aviation ratings for enlisted, we were 30 men in one class. Helped us with the... Uh, trust in the uh, drag on the ships and what was caused the flight and everything else and stalls and engines and radios and everything else because we all knew morse code backwards you know quartermaster i could 
stand on a bridge at that time and read signals from light signals from another ship over here, and I'd give them to the captain before the signal crew brought them up here. But uh, it was just like that, and we did that jerk. So anyway, uh, we got our wings. Beal and Johnny and I all got our wings November 15, 1942, from January 1st of February until, until November in nine months. And uh, we had 350 hours flight time, night time, instrument time, and everything on those times. Well, Johnny went to a uh, utility squadron, and Beale and I were sent from Pensacola to San Diego. We got to San Diego, and we were assigned to VP-11, which is PBYs. And they'd been in Kaneohe at Pearl Harbor, and then they came back, got new planes, and went to Guadalcanal and up. Yes. And they'd come back to the States to get new planes and reorganize. And so we got sent to VP-11. And... Commander Campbell was our skiffle. And uh, so I went to jo uh, Gordon Kennington's crew, and he went into another crew. And of course, at that time, uh, Commander Pacific there in San Diego, and they said, uh, well, we're going to hold you up a month, and we were supposed to fly to Kaneohe. And they painted the PBYs all black. So we're the first black cat squadron. VP 11, 12, 23. Paint us all black so we could fly all night long so they couldn't see any signs of us or anything. And uh, we left uh, San Diego then, 12 of us, Commander Cliff Campbell. And Cliff Campbell called me out of Gordon Kennington's crew to be his co pilot because the co pilots were the navigators at the time, and I'd been a quartermaster and everything. And we had 12 planes going out, so I went to his crew for the flight to Kaneohe. And we took off 5.30 at night and landed at 12.30 the next day, 19.7 hours, 19 and a half hours. So San Diego to Kaneohe at 8,000 feet. And um, all the planes made it to Kaneohe except three of them got looked, uh, they were behind us, and they got, they looked down, they saw Mauna Loa, Mauna Kea in Hawaii, and they thought it was a diamond head, and they turned left and went on down to Hawaii and landed and ran out of gas and landed. And we went on into Kaneohe, but they had to gas up and fly back to Kaneohe then. And we were there at Kaneohe for two months. We flew out to Midway and helped the Air Force navigate on their, uh, it was the Army Air Corps at that time, because they'd fly to Midway and go out and take a 100 mile cross and come back in and miss the island. And so we. They didn't have the navigation, ocean navigation. So we went over there and we flew with them and I flew with them and navigated and showed them how to navigate and look at the water and say it was 12 or 15 knots and to have four degrees drift or five degrees drift or whatever it was. And so they appreciated it. We were out there about 10 days was all and did about 10 flights, 12, 14 hour flights. Came back to Honolulu and we all took off VP-11 for Perth, Australia. Before the attack, before the Pearl Harbor attack, did, did you and your, your mates feel that war was coming with Japan? Did, did you guys think an attack was imminent, or was it a complete surprise? Everybody knew that it was coming, just didn't know when. Even when I went home in November 1940, a year before, for my young sister's wedding, my older sister was going to Loretta Heights College. She's two years older than I am. And I was there for couple of three days and uh, for her wedding and everything. And my older sister said, Lois, I'm going into the convent. I'm going to be a nun, Loretta Nun. I said, oh, you are? She says, yes. She says, you're in the Navy and you're going to go to war and somebody has to pray for you. And that was in November 1940. So everybody in the States knew that we were heading. Remember the Japanese, that war didn't start there in Pearl Harbor. It started in 1932. The Japanese went through Korea. Korea at that time was a one country. They went through Korea, Manchuria, and uh, eastern uh, China, all the way down the East China coast from 1932 to 1941. And they must have killed five to seven million Chinese on the way down. And... Uh, 
we knew that someday it was going to come. We had Philip. We had our fleet, Asiatic fleet, was based in the Philippines today, Manila. You know, Civic Bay, and uh, we'd been out there for years since uh, uh, 1905. When when the 45 came into the Navy, the reason that came in was because the guerrillas and the 38s wouldn't get knocked down with one bullet. And they designed that in 1905, so it had 4,500 pounds of pressure there. And uh, that's when we got the 45. It was so heavy. That 45, because in 1940, 41, we had uh, uh, practice at Bishop Point all the time. I was on the, 40, on the pistol team. And uh, we knew one shot would knock you down. 45 pounds, 4,500 pounds of pressure, one shot. And we had seven shots in the clip, you know. So we didn't need to do like today. They shoot 10, 15, 20 rounds just at somebody that they're shooting at. They only need one. These policemen and everything, what they need is more training, training, training with that gun so they can just boom one shot and, and that's it. And they saved the rest. We were taught to save the rest of the ammunition because we might be behind the line somewhere we might need to keep it for months so that's why we anyway uh so so that that morning um of december 7th what do you what is the first thing you remember did you hear the first planes coming across when the first planes came across the first ones hit Kanyoi, and they came across the hill when they came across the hill it was immediately that we sounded general quarters. Everybody saw the reds, and they knew immediately what it was. And their guns were firing within 30 seconds on the ships and on the beach. And you guys were ready. Well, we, only, we had two ways. The first way did most of the damage, because we had eight battleships there, and they sunk those. So that was the main part of the fleet. When the Nevada pulled out to head up the channel, all of the planes out of the hills headed for her because they wanted to sink her in the channel. They had to close the fleet off for six, eight months so they got her out of there. And that's when the chief quartermaster beached her up there to Barber's Point. And then he, they were going to court martial him because the captain hadn't told him to, but then they decided to give him the uh, Sting of Service Cross because it was the best thing in the world. He knew exactly what he was doing. And so uh, it was. it happens... We came in and we shouldn't be in there. Eight battleships were in port. And the Utah was over there and they reported they'd sunk a carrier. Well, the Utah in the 1930s, the early 30s, had been taken, it was a battleship, and it was main, uh, taken off the decks and put a platform there for landing. And there was a target ship after that for the last five, six, seven, eight years of the, before Pearl Harbor. And it was moored over there. It's still there today because they sunk it. But the Japanese reported they sunk the carrier that was parked there, and it wasn't. It was the Utah. And but we had eight battleships in there, and every one of them were sunk. So, oh. if we'd have been to sea, a couple of us might have got sunk at sea. But the Japanese fleet that that brought three carriers in there and battleships and cruisers and everything else from the north. They trained at the north end of Japan. They came across the north, south of Alaska, and turned. And December the 4th is when they sent their message that east wind rain that they were going to attach Pearl Harbor within 42 hours. Colonel Thorpe out of Indonesia got it and sent it to Roosevelt, and Roosevelt held it. And Kimmel and Short didn't get the uh, telegram or the notice of it until 2 o'clock Sunday afternoon after the raid was over with. So uh, it was, we all knew it. it was, the minute the first plane we came across, general quarters were sounded, the first guns were bought, and, and the first wave was in and out in 15 minutes, you know. They don't, they don't spend too much time, but everything happens. And then the second wave came in at uh, 8.30, and that's when most of the Japanese got shot down was the second wave. And uh, the, ones that came, the ones that were shot down, you know, they had... I think uh, 365 planes come in there, and they lost 160 or something planes. But then they took off, got back to their carrier, 
and went over past Midway and then up into Japan and they got back to Japan when they anchored.